President Lok Yoon Seok Yeol's transition team is launched. The handover of important data and duties from the previous administration will ensure they're up to speed when Yoon's term begins. South Korea looks to ease COVID-19 restrictions. This comes when the daily tally is reported to be above 400,000. Russia launches missile strikes near an airport in Lviv, a city that had been a sanctuary for Ukrainians fleeing the country. It's also prompting the South Korean temporary embassy there to be closed. Hello, we're wrapping up the week well. I'm Daniel Che here to bring the latest. Let's begin with our top story. South Korea's president-elect and his transition team have officially begun work at their new temporary office. For the next 50 days before Yoon sung yeols term begins, the team will work on the policies and plans. Kim do yeon starts us off. At this building in Tongidong of Seoul, Revealed with great enthusiasm by its 24 members, the sign reads, Presidential Transition Committee. On Friday, kicking off with this signboard hanging ceremony was a team to help President-elect Yoon sung yeol in his preparation for his upcoming term. Eight days since the election, this building now officially houses the office of the President-elect. For the next 50 days, what happens here will shape the country's next five years. Immediately following the ceremony was the president-elect leading the committee's all-member meeting for the first time, calling on the members to focus on the livelihoods of the people. In addition, he said how a presidential term will look like in the end is reflected in how it does in the beginning. According to the spokesperson for the president-elect, Kim Moon-hye, the most pressing issue for the transition committee is responding to COVID-19. Chairman of the committee, An Cher Su, will also be in charge of the measures to fight the pandemic, and Yoon requested that the plans be focused on two things. 특히 <웃음> 코로나가 다시 가파르게 확산되고 있는데 코로나 비상대응 특별위원회에서는 영세 자영업자 소상공인 분들에 대한 신속한 손실 보상과 더불어 방역 in addition, he said the committee will need to lay the foundation so that during his term, the country can step forward as a leader in the fourth industrial revolution. As for the economy, he says the country needs to tackle income inequality as well as a slowed growth. In the meantime, Chairman An met with Lee Jong Chan, head of the late former President Kim Dae Jung's transition committee, to seek advice. He said it's time to focus and make decisions and claim that some of the shortfalls of the current administration came as it didn't have a transition committee taking over from an impeached president. An said he will try not to be too greedy and will focus on his priorities. Kim Do-yeon, Arirang News. Yoon met with a former UN chief and discussed a multitude of global issues. The president-elect reportedly wanted Ban Ki-moon's advice on the ongoing war in Ukraine, as well as ways to tackle climate change. The ex-Secretary General highlighted that the country must achieve its goal of going carbon neutral by 2050 and reiterated the importance of the Seoul-Washington alliance. The president-elect also had lunch with the leadership of the People Power Party following his transition committee meeting, expressing hopes of working closely with them during his term. The president-elect spokesperson announced that the nation's top office will be returned to the people before the spring flowers fall and it will be moved to a place closer to the heart of the public. The defense ministry building is looking like the top contender for the new site. Kim Hyun-sung provides a glimpse of what the office in Yongsan might look like. One of the very first things President-elect Yoon suk yeol has said he will do when taking office is moving that presidential office out of the current Blue House. 
We want to come out of the Blue House, which has been a symbol of absolute power in Korean history. We want to give that power back to the people. So the president will go into the public and the Blue House will be returned to the people before the spring flowers fall. Several former administrations have promised the same move, but have failed to stick by their word. They cited security and cost problems. But with spokesperson Kim saying that there is absolutely no chance of Yoon taking office in the Blue House, all eyes are on Yoon seok and his transition team to see whether they can deliver where others have failed. Yoon and his team have narrowed down their top two choices to the Foreign Ministry building in Gwangamun and the Defense Ministry building in Yongsan. But with the Gwangamun building laced with security concerns and a lack of space, some say that the building in Yongsan is rising as the most likely choice. If the office is moved to Yongsan, this is what it will most likely look like. The office will be surrounded by Yongsan Park, scheduled to be built on the area's former U.S. military base. The park will be open to the public, shortening the distance between the president and the people. For the building itself, an insider to Yoon's team says that the press room will be located on the first floor to open up the stream of communication and to make information more accessible. Some sources say that the plans for the new office were inspired by the White House. The famous Washington building is adjacent to the Lafayette Square and the Ellipse Public Parks. The press room is also housed on the first floor of the West Wing. But even if this historic change happens, Yoon will not be free of the challenges and criticism that have barred other administrations from following through with this move. Already some critics say that Yoon is rushing through with this decision without a fully formed public consensus. Kim Hyun-sung, Arirang News. President Moon Jae-in wants to meet soon with the president-elect. He says it's a duty both the incoming and the outgoing leaders have to the public. Such a session was scheduled this week, but it was canceled. Yoon Jung-min has the full story. President Moon Jae-in called for a prompt meeting on Friday with President Oleg Yoon suk yeol adding that the Blue House door is always open and that he doesn't think there needs to be certain coordination before the meeting. Regarding the meeting with President-elect Yoon suk yeol President Moon Jae-in said it is part of their duty to the public to have a meeting at an early date and have candid talks. The President-elect spokesperson said on Friday that President Moon and President-elect Yoon are closely communicating over the meeting based on mutual trust. She added that they will continue efforts to reach a desirable result for the public. This comes as their original meeting this week was cancelled, citing incomplete working-level coordination, presumably because of politically sensitive issues, including a potential pardon for the imprisoned former President Lee Myung-bak. It has been nine days since the presidential election. As for previous meetings between presidents and presidents-elect, former President Kim Yong-sam and his successor Kim Dae-jung met only two days after the election in 1997. In another case, former President Do Tae-woo met his successor Kim Yong-sam 18 days after the election in January 1993. President Moon Jae-in did not have such a meeting, though, as he came to power after his predecessor Park Geun-hye was impeached. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. As of 9 p.m. local time, South Korea reported more than 360,000 additional COVID-19 cases. Authorities are slightly relaxing distancing rules to allow bigger gatherings, but restaurants will still have to close at 11, mainly due to potential strain on the medical system caused by the ongoing surge. Han Sung-woo brings the updates. South Korean health authorities have eased the country's social distancing guidelines to allow larger private gatherings of up to eight people max two more than the current six. However, business hours for restaurants and cafes will not be extended to midnight from the current 11 p.m., despite public anticipation. Officials explaining that now is not the time, pointing to the recent increase in the number of patients in severe or critical condition. It's time to modify the current social distancing scheme, but it's too much of a risk to drastically ease measures, considering the Omicron surge and the uncertainty surrounding its peak, as well as the strain on the medical system. This comes as the government mulls over whether to relabel COVID-19 from a Class 1 infectious disease to a Class 2 disease. 
Despite some criticism from the medical community, officials have increasingly been comparing its fatality rate, 0.09% as of last month, to that of the seasonal flu. As such, lifting restrictions altogether was once considered a possibility, but those chances came crashing down over the past few weeks as cases soared into the six digits. The country reported its second highest daily tally ever of 407,017 new infections on Friday, 200,000 less than the all-time high set the day before, but another heavy addition to the total caseload, now at 8.65 million. An increasing proportion of those are less vaccinated teenagers and infants who haven't been inoculated at all. With 301 more lives lost, the death toll now stands at a little under 11,800. The number of patients currently in severe or critical condition, meanwhile, continues to be in the thousands for over 10 days now, now at 1,049. And to care for them better, authorities announced on Thursday plans to further concentrate medical resources on those most in need. To efficiently allocate the limited number of beds for intensive care or special treatment, we will update suitability assessments and more actively relocate patients that are no longer isolating to different hospitals. Health authorities are attributing the recent uptick in cases to both the adoption of rapid antigen tests for official purposes and the spread of what's being dubbed Stealth Omicron. Han Sung-woo, Arirang News. Turning now to the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, South Korea's temporary embassy in Lviv is being closed down. This comes as more blasts have been reported near Ukraine's second largest airport in that western city, well away from the main battle sites. Aram Jiang is standing by on the line with the latest. Jiang, do fill us in. Daniel, South Korea's foreign ministry said in a statement on Friday that officials at the temporary embassy in Lviv have evacuated along with South Korean nationals. Five South Korean nationals had been staying in Lviv as of 9 a.m. local time on Friday, but only three fled to Hungary with the embassy officials. The remaining two decided to remain in Lviv despite the embassy's pleas to leave. The ministry said that it'll conduct daily safety checks on the two that decided to stay. Earlier, the ministry stated that escalating military threats had hindered the temporary embassy in being able to function properly and ensure the safety of its staff. But temporary offices in Chernivtsi in southwestern Ukraine, as well as in Romania, are to remain open. This comes as those in Ukraine have said multiple explosions have been heard and a mushroom-shaped large plume of smoke was seen at about 6.30 a.m. on Friday local time in the city of Lviv. The city's mayor said, in, said several Russian missiles hit an aircraft repair plant close to the international airport. Located about 70 kilometers from the Polish border, Lviv is very close to NATO and attacks can lead to potential international repercussions. Although it is a city of just over 700,000, it hosts more than 200,000 displaced Ukrainians searching for safety. Also, the wider area is considered as a major weapon supply route to the Ukrainian military. Well, meanwhile, Jiang, we hear President Joe Biden and his Chinese counterpart have set to hold a phoner, and this comes amid growing concerns over Beijing's relationship with Moscow. Yes, you're right, Daniel. Biden and Xi are to hold direct talks at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday, their first direct talks since November. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said in an earlier briefing that Biden will make clear that China will bear responsibility for any actions it takes to support Russia's aggression, and such actions would be followed by costs. He also told reporters that he agrees with President Joe Biden that war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Yesterday, President Biden said that, in his opinion, war crimes have been committed in Ukraine. Personally, I agree. Intentionally targeting civilians is a war crime. After all the destruction of the past three weeks, I find it difficult to conclude that the Russians are doing otherwise. 
Ahead of the call on Friday, Chinese Foreign Affairs spokesperson Zhao Lujan told reporters that China always stands for respecting the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries. Meanwhile, if Ukrainian resist resistance to Russia's invasion continues, President Vladimir Putin is expected to make threats to use nuclear weapons against the West. This is according to a new assessment by the Pentagon's Defense Intelligence Agency. The agency said the combination of drainage in manpower and consequent economic sanctions will threaten Russia's ability to produce modern precision-guided munitions, and added that it'll increasingly rely on nuclear clear weapons to project strength. This is all I have for now. Back to you, Daniel. All right, Jiang, thank you for those updates. We appreciate it. Moving on to other stories now. Two days after North Korea attempted an ICBM test, a number of vehicles were seen at the place where they launched the missile, possibly for cleanup. Also, troops were spotted at its parade training ground in Pyongyang. Peunji provides a deeper analysis. North Korea has been seen positioning vehicles at Sunan International Airport, located in its capital city of Pyongyang, the same place where the North attempted to test its new ICBM, Pasong-17, on Wednesday, but failed. South Korea's military reportedly said the missile exploded at some point, below an altitude of 20 kilometers. Citing a commercial satellite image, 38 North, a research program at a Washington-based think tank, said that just a day after the launch, the regime positioned around 50 vehicles at both parallel runways at the Sunan airport and in the airfield in between. It said the presence of so many vehicles is unusual and that this likely involves cleanup efforts. Also on Friday, Voice of America News reported that the North is showing signs of preparing for a military parade. It said a satellite image taken on Wednesday shows troops at the parade training ground of Bidim Airport in Pyongyang. It added that the number of troops is estimated to be at least 1,000 and could reach as many as 6,000. Over the last several years, training usually began one to several months ahead of the event. All eyes are on whether the North will hold a large-scale military parade next month, on April 15th, to mark the 110th anniversary of the birth of its founder, Kim Il-sung. Meanwhile, there have also been reports that North Korea has started removing a hotel built by South Korea at Mount Kumgang that was once a symbol of inter-Korean reconciliation. When asked about it, the Unification Ministry said Friday that the government has been closely monitoring the situation, but said it's too early to jump to any conclusions. Our government has been taking a firm stance and that North Korea should not take any measures that could infringe the property rights of South Korean companies and that all issues should be resolved through negotiations between the two Koreas. The spokesperson added that the government will continue to review measures needed to resolve the situation, such as through the joint liaison office. Peunji, Arirang News. Seoul's defense chief and his counterpart from the UAE reaffirmed that defense industrial cooperation is a top priority in the special strategic partnership between the two countries. During Mohammed Ahmed Abouardi's visit to Seoul for the 9th South Korea UAE defense minister's meeting on Friday, the two vowed to further expand cooperation in the fields of information and cyberspace, joint military drills, and future aerospace industry. Regarding the recent deal with UAE to export South Korea's mid-range surface-to-air missile Cheongung-2, so pledge all support to help the UAE secure operational capabilities. The duo also visited South Korea's Seoul aircraft manufacturer, Kai, and discussed future cooperation on high-tech weapon systems. We shift our focus to the aftermath of the 7.4 magnitude earthquake that rattled northeast Japan on Wednesday, reportedly killing at least four. The force of nature cut off power and water supplies, and a high-speed train was derailed. Ishii has the latest. The earthquake that hit off the coast of Japan's eastern Miyagi and Fukushima prefectures on Wednesday has reportedly killed at least four people and injured at least 107 others. I woke up a little before midnight, surprised by the earthquake. I always open the door so I can escape. According to Asahi's report on Friday, the earthquake disrupted water supply to 17,000 households across five prefectures. Japan's self-defense forces set up temporary water stations and residents lined up to get water. And the quake cut power to over 2 million homes, although most of the power has been restored. The earthquake also caused a high-speed train to derail near Fukushima. 
According to public broadcaster NHK, 78 people were trapped for four hours after the train derailed but escaped unharmed through an emergency exit. Some trains were suspended due to the derailment and East Japan Railway said it may take a considerable amount of time until operations resume in full. Road traffic was disrupted as some highways in the region were closed on Thursday. Manufacturing was also affected by the quake. Toyota Motor Corporation and Nissan Motor Company have temporarily suspended factory operations in the area. The region was devastated by a huge earthquake and tsunami in 2011, which also damaged a nuclear power plant in Fukushima. The Chinese state-run Global Times reported on Thursday some analysts' worries that the recent quake may accelerate Japan's plan to discharge nuclear wastewater from that plant into the sea as earthquakes could increase the risk of storage tank leaks. The operator of the Fukushima plant said in December 2021 that it intends to build an underwater tunnel to release the contaminated water into the sea with plans for initial release in spring 2023. Meanwhile, the country's Nuclear Regulation Authority told the International Atomic Energy Agency on Thursday that this latest quake did not cause any issues at the three nuclear power plants in the area. Yi si Arirang News. Countries around the world are slowly easing travel restrictions and people are finally getting their passports out. With South Korea recently changing its passport design, the foreign ministry is holding an exhibition on the history of the nation's passports. Song Yoo-jin provides a closer look. Starting next Monday, travelers from South Korea no longer need to quarantine when they return home from most destinations. Following this green light, Koreans eager to make up for two years without an overseas trip are now checking their calendars and packing their bags. And there's one thing they can't forget when heading to the airport. Passports. Most South Koreans haven't had a chance to use their passports for a while. But for those wanting a closer look at the history of the Korean passport, the Diplomatic Archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is holding an exhibition from this Friday. The first Korean passport traces back to the Joseon dynasty in the 19th century. After opening up its port in 1876, Joseon started issuing a one-page document called a chipjo. This paper passport evolved into the familiar notebook form after foreign travel rules were made in 1949. However, as people were restricted from traveling abroad until 1989, passports only became common in South Korea in the late 1980s. E-passports came in 2008, containing the holder's personal information in a built-in chip to improve security. The highlight of the exhibition is the new e-passport design. First handed out in December of 2021, the latest passport not only exhibits a new design, but also cutting-edge technology. Taking public opinion into account, the passport cover was changed from green to navy. Each page includes illustrations of South Korean cultural heritage. The personal information page is now made of polycarbonate, a type of plastic that lowers the chances of forgery. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs has high hopes for the exhibition. We planned this exhibition as we wanted to introduce the history and the process of making the South Korean passport to the general public. We hope this event will increase public awareness and interest towards the Korean passport. The exhibition is slated to run until September 30th. Considering the surge in COVID-19 cases, visitors can also see the exhibit through the Diplomatic Archives online VR exhibition hall on its website. Song Yujin, Arirang News. The nation's capital prepared a plan to provide help clean help provide rather clean drinking water in Tanzania. Seoul City has submitted it to the South Korean Foreign Ministry, and if they are approved, around 3.8 million U.S. dollars will be used to build water supply facilities in Tanzania's capital city of Dodoma and in rural areas of Arusha. The plan is for Seoul to work on the project with the Korea International Cooperation Agency starting in 2023. Conditions will stay colder than the seasonal norms for the next few days. 
Morning temperatures in the capital will be especially cold with readings near zero degrees. Along with colder temperatures, a band of rain clouds will be spreading showers until tomorrow. Most regions will see 5 to 30 millimeters of rainfall until early tomorrow morning, while the capital region will also see light snowflakes flying around. The surrounding regions will see more snowfall. Parts of northern central regions are currently under heavy snow alerts. In fact, for mountainous regions of Gangwondo province, more than 30 centimeters of snowfall has been recorded. Another 10 to 30 centimeters are in the forecast, so please be aware. Morning lows will range from 1 to 9 degrees nationwide. Seoul will start off at 3 degrees Celsius. As for the daily highs, Seoul and Chuncheon will get up to 7 degrees. Gwangju 9 and Busan will make it to 8 degrees Celsius. Temperatures will stay below the seasonal norms until the beginning of next week. That's all for now, and here are the weather conditions around the world. Time to wrap things up. As always, thank you for staying with us.